John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Roger Stern, Dollar. Oh, hello, Mr. Stern. What can I do for you? We insured Jonathan Fellows. Somebody tried to kill him. Is that the Jonathan Bellows? The industrialist. Yeah? His wife went to the police, but Bellows refuses any protection. Doesn't seem worried. Considers the potential assassin just a crank. Well, what do you want me to do? Look into it. We insure Bellows for a half million. I suggest you talk to his wife first. She's staying at the town apartment. Number one park. Mrs. Edith Bellows. She'll expect you. <laughs> Right now, I'd like to take a few minutes of your time to pass on a thought which, incidentally, concerns time. According to the Bible, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. We all agree on that, I'm sure. And we'll also agree that the regulation of time also depends on the season. For example... Did it ever occur to you who decided where our four time zones in America should be exactly? Well, back maybe 75 years ago, there were about 150 different time zones which were set up according to the whim of the local inhabitants. Most of the time was called sun time. And there could be 15 minutes difference between the clocks of two towns only 10 miles apart. So, to get rid of the confusion... The Interstate Commerce Commission was established. It divided the United States into four standard time zones so that railroads, planes, buses, and the mail could run on schedule. Of course, if a city wants to go on daylight saving time during the summer, that's a decision which is made locally. The standard time remains the same everywhere else. But setting the nation's clocks isn't the only job of the Interstate Commerce Commission, however. It also makes rules and regulations for the various means of transportation which go from one state to another. It sees that railroads, truck lines, barges, and boats operate safely, charge reasonable rates, and give good, dependable service. It also protects trucks and bus drivers from working such long hours that they might fall asleep while they're driving. The commission also demands that trains, engines, and machines have safety and stop devices. It is, in itself, a safety device to assure every one of us freedom from danger as we travel about our country. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Intercontinental Indemnity and Bonding Corporation, New York City. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Jonathan Bellows matter. Expense account item one, $29.65. Mileage and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. I arrived at number one Park Avenue close to two o'clock. Mrs. Edith Bellows, a very attractive redhead somewhere in the early 30s, met me at the bar and showed me into her luxurious apartment. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. Mr. Stern explained the situation to you? Only that someone tried to kill your husband. Yes, day before yesterday. Uh, Jonathan was walking in the garden. Someone shot at him. Fortunately, they missed. Mr. Stern said your husband refused police protection. He's a very unusual man, Mr. Dollar. I would say so. He's not a young man, 63. He's retiring and doesn't particularly care for people, especially people who meddle. Unfortunately, he considers the police meddlers. Has he hired any kind of protection? No. Isn't he worried? Well, he doesn't show it. But knowing him as I do, I'd say he's mildly concerned. Someone takes a shot at him and he's only mildly concerned? It's the nature of the beast, Mr. Dollar. Well, I'm sure you're aware that intercontinental indemnity is more than mildly concerned. Yes, and so am I. For the whole family, for that matter. I'll certainly give you all the cooperation that I can. I think everyone else in the family will be greatly relieved. Except your husband. I'm afraid he won't like it much. It'll be pretty hard investigating if he has me thrown out of my ear. Well, you've one thing in your favor. You're not a policeman. Yeah. But when I'm on a job, Mrs. Bellows, I've been known to meddle and meddle and meddle. We 
We've talked some more about Jonathan Bellows. Mrs. Bellows had married him eight years before, taking her place as number three in his collection of wives. Her predecessors had retired to lives of leisure on their alimony. Bellows had one son, Ralph, by his first marriage, now 23 years old. Around 3 o'clock, we went downstairs and climbed into a bright new station wagon. An hour later, we were driving up a long, circular driveway that led to the Bellows Mansion. We parked and went in. Jonathan's probably in the library. Hi. Oh, hello. Mr. Dollar, this is Ralph Bellows. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? The insurance? Yes. Everyone know about this? Everyone except... Your husband? Yes. (laughs) He's in the library with Professor Wilt. (laughs) Going to blow a fuse. Going to be funny, huh? Well, in a way, yes. Uh, you might not get much of a laugh, Miles. Uh-huh. Ralph, that's not very considerate. Miles, well, the truth, and you know it. The old man's going to take off like a skyrocket. I personally think it's very funny. I'm not being vindictive. I'm, I'm just being honest. <laughs> Look, Mr. Dollar, I haven't anything against you. I, I don't even know you, but my father's a tough, bigoted, unreasonable old man, and I've had to put up with it all my life. Ralph. Well, it's the truth. Ninety-nine percent of the time, he gets his own way, but when he doesn't, he creates the most magnificent explosion you've ever seen. (laughs) Gloatingly, I am proud to say that I have been responsible on several occasions for lighting the fuse. Do you own a gun? Oh, don't be ridiculous. I didn't take that shot at him. Oh, no, of course not. Ralph, just as concerned as the rest of us. Ralph, I think we'd better... Yes, yes, certainly. Uh, (laughs) Can you take it, Mr. Dollar? That's why I'm here. Then allow me to escort you to the library. Hmm? You're spoiled, Ralph. Mm, rotten. Who is it? The Atomic Energy Commission. What? You have visitors. What did you say about the Atomic... Oh, he's just being silly. Hello, Professor. Hello, how are you, Regis? You've beaten him three straight games. Who's that with you? Oh, this is Mr. Dollar, dear. Uh, he's going to find out who took that shot at you. What? Now, John, he's an insurance man. Insurance man? <laughs> I'll just sit over here. I'm with Intercontinental Indemnity. What are you and doing I... here? Who sent for you? Now, John, be reasonable. I want to know who in blazes. John, your... now, don't get it. Uh, you stay out of this. Young man, who told you? I was retained by Mr. Stern. I didn't tell Stern to send anyone over here to meddle in my affairs. I brought him here. You did? Why? Because we're all worried. Edith, we've discussed this whole thing. Jonathan, if you don't take it easy... Shut up, shut up. Get out of here, Mr... uh, Mr... Dollar. Get out. Jonathan, please. Are you going to get out of here? Possibly. But stop looking like you're going to throw me out. Young man, just let me tell you... No, I've got a better idea. Sit down. What? Sit down. Why, you young... Now, sit down. Ralph, be still. I've got something to say, and you're going to hear me out. Now look here, Mr. Dollar. You've got no right. Who are you? <laughs> Professor Wills, Johnny Dollar. Okay, Professor. I'm going to say what I've got to say, whether you think I've got any right to or not. If you want to listen, you're welcome. Well, well, thank you. Young man, if you have something to say, say it and get out. Then I'll place a call to your company and see that you're immediately discharged. You're due for a big shock. I don't know how interested you are in maintaining your insurance policy... If this attempt on your life isn't investigated, you're not going to have a policy. Are you finished? No, that's not what I wanted to say. It's this. I've never met you before. I don't know you and I don't want to. You're a big man in your field, but that doesn't entitle you to be rude to me. Now I'll go. But if you ever try throwing your weight around again, I'll throw over my knee and make up for the spankings you must have missed a long time ago. (laughs) I'm sorry, Mrs. Bellows pretty obvious your husband doesn't care how much his family worries about him. Now, if you'll let me call a cab, I'll get out of here. Uh, uh, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Would you stay a moment? No. Count found a young man now who's being rude. Compared to you, I'm still in the bush leagues. Would you please stay for a moment? I'd, I'd like very much to talk to you. Please. Mr. Dollar. You'll be miserable. And you keep your mouth shut, Ralph. Uh, yes, father. Well, Mr. Dollar. Okay. Uh, if you excuse us, I'd I'd like to be alone with Mr. Dollar. Certainly, dear. We'll finish the game later, Professor. Of course. And I want to see you later, Ralph. Of course. Uh, Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Let's keep it this way. I'm still a little nervous. Uh, How much do you know about this shooting? Only that someone tried it on you. 
Mr. Dollar, I know who took that shot at me. You do? Here. Read this letter. I missed you in the garden. I won't miss you again. You'll pay for... Ashanti? Ashanti. It's in Africa. Thirty years ago, I was in the mining business. I had a partner, Frank Victor. We didn't get along, and there was an argument one day in the mine. It was quite a scrap, and there was a cave-in. I got out. Frank didn't. There was an investigation, and I was cleared. Why are you telling me this? Because I've decided to trust you. I'm not particularly fond of you, but I believe that you can get things done. I'm working for the insurance company, Mr. Bellows. Certainly, but uh, as I'm sure you must have gathered, this sort of thing can create some very unfavorable publicity. Do you think this Frank Victor is alive? He must be. I've never told anyone of this incident. Well, there were certainly other people involved when it happened. Yes, but no one who was out to get me. Why would anyone else but Frank Victor want to kill me? But he didn't kill you. Maybe it was someone who knew of the accident. But what would he have to gain? Blackmail, maybe? I told you it was an accident. Sure. But maybe someone figured they could scare you into believing Frank Victor was still alive. Out to kill you. You pay over enough money and... Not on your life. Not my life, Mr. Bellows. Yours. But why wait this long? Thirty years. I have to admit that kind of stops me. You've been a big man in the business world for a long time. Nobody will ever have any trouble locating you. What do you intend doing first? Going back to New York. Why? Oh, lots of little things. Uh, Mr. Dollar, as long as I have taken you into my confidence... Mr. Bellows, someone took a shot at you. It might happen again and you might be dead. Now, if you want me to prevent something like that, you'll just have to trust me. My wife drove you here? Yes. Then you need a car. Take the station wagon. Well, now, When do you think you'll be returning... Probably tomorrow. Well, you can stay at the town apartment. I want to be in touch with you. You might just as well take advantage of the empty apartment at number one, Park Avenue. Yes, I know. I'll see you tomorrow. I left without saying goodbye to the rest of the family and drove the bright new station wagon back to town. I stopped off at the time where I wallowed through the morgue file for three or four hours. I went back 30 years to find what I was looking for. A small article dated the Shanti, Africa, 1923. It didn't say much more than what Jonathan Bellows had already told me. It mentioned the mine cave in and a pending investigation into the death of Frank Victor, Jonathan Bellows' partner. In an edition dated three weeks later, I found the account of the investigation and a verified Bellows' story about the verdict. Satisfied, I left the newspaper and drove to number one Park Avenue where I received a royal greeting from the doorman who informed me that Mr. Bellows had phoned to make sure I had everything I needed. In the apartment, I poured myself a drink, took off my shoes, stretched out on the sofa, and put in a call to Roger Stern. Yes, Dollar? I want some information on the Bellows family, past and present. Sure. Find out where his other two wives are and how long they've been there. Put a man on it right away. And find out about a Professor Wilt. Wilt? Yeah, W-I-L-T, I think friend of Bellows. Plays chess with him. Also, I'll need a background on all the servants. What do you want? It? Pick it up tomorrow morning. If you want to reach me, I'm at, uh, wait a minute. Plaza 52099. Number one, Park Avenue. Do I know her? <laughs> oh, I wish you were right. The apartment belongs to Bellows. He let me use his station wagon, too. I don't believe it. It's my big blue eyes. I just batted them a couple of times and pressed them. Pressed them? Sure. Station wagon, Park Avenue apartment. And he better be nice to me. A couple of more bats and he might buy me my own insurance company. <laughs> Expense account item two, $7.50, dinner. After which I returned to the apartment and considered making a few calls that might relieve a lonely evening. I referred to my meager list of availables and was just about to try my luck when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar? Yeah? This is Mr. Bellows. I'd like you to pick something up for me. I was just trying to do the same for myself. I'd like you to go to 955 East 108th Street and pick up a... Yes, Mr. Dollar? 
up a package for me. Bring it right out. Sure. Is anything wrong? Mr. Bellows. Nothing's wrong, Mr. Dollar. Just pick up the package and bring it right out to me. Well, sure. 955 East 108th Street? Yes. It's a bar. Ask the bartender for the package. Bring it right out. Okay. Goodbye. Mr. Bellows, are you sure there isn't something... Mr. Bellows. Mr. Bellows. John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. I went downstairs, climbed into the station wagon, and wheeled it east to 108th Street, where I located number 955. It was a bar. The blue pheasant. I parked and went in. I introduced myself to the bartender, and he gave me the package Bellows wanted. Then I left and drove upstate to the Bellows mansion. Hello. Good evening. Uh, where's your husband? Well, I think he's still in the study. He was a little while ago. You going out? Yes, to see some friends. Where's Ralph? Well, he went out just after you left this afternoon. Jonathan gave him a pretty harsh scolding. Uh-huh. Been shopping? Package for your husband. Called me about an hour and a half ago. Wanted me to pick it up. What is it? I don't know, but it's heavy. Well, I'll see you later, Mr. Dollar. Uh, Mrs. Bellows. Yes? Your husband's a healthy man, isn't he? Well, yes, of course. Why? Well, when I talked to him on the phone, he sounded, well... What? Well, I don't know. It was strange. I just was... said goodbye to him. He seemed fine. He played chess with the professor until about seven. I saw him right after that. He seemed fine then. <laughs> There's nothing the matter with my husband, Mr. Dollar. Huh. He's in the library, huh? Yes. Now have a good time. Oh, thank you. Bye. Yes? Good evening. Well, I thought you weren't coming back till tomorrow, Dollar. What? You said when you left, you weren't coming back till tomorrow. But when I talked to you on the phone... Talked to me on the phone? Yeah, when you asked me to pick up this package. Package? Yeah, here. From that bar. Oh, yes, the package. Mr. Bellas. Just give me the package. What's wrong with you? Nothing's wrong, just give me the package. It's very important. I've got to open it. Okay. You're sure you're all right? Mr. Bellas. Mr. Dollar? Oh, Ralph. Thought you'd gone out. Yeah, I just got in. I was just calling a company doctor. A doctor? I think there's something wrong with your father. What do you mean? He called me about an hour and a half ago. Told me to pick up a package. I just brought it in to him, and he acted like he never even phoned me. Well, maybe he didn't. Maybe someone else. But won't. when he saw the package, he seemed to know all about it. It was odd. It was as though I suddenly wasn't even in the room. He took the pack. Felt like the whole building was coming down around my ears. Ralph and I were thrown back against the wall. And by the time we got up, the library was a smoking black hole. Dad! Jonathan Bellows had been blown to kingdom come. It was a bomb, all right. A big one. Planted in the package I'd given him. I called the police and Ralph located Mrs. Bellows. Then I jumped back into the station wagon and doubled the speed limit getting back to town. The police would be busy enough until I got back. I wanted to get hold of that bartender who had given me the package. By the time I got to the Blue Pheasant, it was pretty well filled with customers. But the bartender I was looking for wasn't in sight. 
Yeah, well, it be. Where's the bartender who was working here earlier? He gets off at eight. Where does he live? Why? I'm collecting addresses. Now, where does he live? You collect addresses. I collect wise guys. Beat it. Look, friend. That bartender is mixed up in a killing. What? Murder. He's a bad boy. Now, you want to give me his address, or do I make a call and flood this place with cops? Murder? You know, when someone dies the hard way and society frowns. Now, come on. What's his name? Where does he live? Uh, Earl. Earl Phillips. 588 East 157th Street. Thanks. You've been just wonderful. Well, look, I didn't know it was anything like murder. You're honest, if I'd have known, I wouldn't have given you any... Please, please. I'm getting all choked up. I drove across town to 157th Street and found 588 East, a big apartment house. Earl Phillips was registered in 405. I gave him a few minutes while I knocked my knuckles loose, then went and dug up the landlady to have her open the door. Oh, she was a dream. About four years older than Grant's tomb, with a gin disposition that would make a lost weekend seem like a Miami vacation. The type that should never have been dug up. Now, look, honey... I've got cleaning to do. Look, sweetheart. Sweetheart. Uh, an expression of fondness. Uh, look, Buster. Don't give me no words longer than one syllable. Cop. You? Cops got badges. Here. Uh, don't look like a badge to me. These are my credentials. Uh, John. Johnny. Uh, I should have brought my glasses. Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Insurance? Now, let me explain, madam. I work with the police. I don't sell policies. I'm an investigator. I investigate things. Yeah, yeah. Well, suppose you tell me what you're investigating. Murder. Murder? Uh, Mr. Phillips? With the door open, we'll both know so much. Oh, okay. Turn on the lights. Oh, my lamps. Yeah, mine too. Is he? He sure is. Still warm. Uh, I'm not interested. I need a drink. Did you see him come in? No, no. You see anybody else come in? I've been in my apartment all afternoon. I'm going right back there. Come here. Do I have to? What's in there? Where? In another room. In the bedroom. Well, what are we whispering for? In the other rooms. Why? Answer me. Bathroom. Fire escape. Huh? Where is it? Oh, end of the hall. Please, Matt, what are we whispering for? There's some blood leading to that bedroom. <gasps> Take it easy. Go downstairs and call the police. Go down to the police and call stairs. No, no. Call the 15th. I got it. Goodbye. Fifteenth precinct. Fifteenth precinct. Yes. Ernie Phillips, the bartender who had given me the package with the bomb in it, had been stabbed to death. There were several drops of blood leading to the bedroom door. And there was a good chance the killer had been surprised and couldn't get out. I went to the door and tried it as quietly as I could. It gave, and I kicked it open. He was standing right by the door, and he had a knife. <laughs> Listen to me, Professor. Bad? Yes. Landlady's after the police. You want to tell me about it? Sure. Help me sit up. All right. Thank you. I suppose you wonder how Bellows called for that package with the bomb. It was his voice. It was Bellows. I've known him for a number of years. I was treating him for his nerves. You an MD? No. Years ago, I worked in a carny at the carnival. Card tricks, you know, magic, hypnosis. I, I finally managed to 
save enough and set myself up as a psychotherapist. It was arranged I meet Bellas at a party. I told him I could help him. Actually, I did help him. Simple hypnosis. Turned out to be a good setup. Paid me well while I had him on. I, I learned a lot about his business and his, and his personal life, too. He told you about the Ashanti affair? Yes. We decided to make it look like blackmail. We? That's Edith, Mrs. Bellows. She would have gotten half of the estate and then the other half to Ralph. And, and Mr. Dollar, uh, I think I'm dying. The police should be here any minute. Well, it was Edith's idea. Uh, I met her some time ago. She arranged the meeting with Jonathan. He was hypnotized when he called me? Yes. I left the bomb with Ernie. Uh, was a bartender I'd known for a long time. He didn't know anything about it, but he... He would have identified me as the one who gave him the package. And Bellows was hypnotized when I walked into the library with the package? No, it was post-hypnotic suggestion. Told him when he was given the package, he was to take it immediately and open it. You can hypnotize a man, tell him to do something hours later when he's awake and he'll do it? Well, he did it, didn't he? Yeah. He certainly did. Well, here they come. Oh, are they? Now you know. Sirens. Can't you hear them? What's that? I said sirens. That's how I knew the police were. Professor. Professor. Well... Who wouldn't have liked the sound anyway? Mrs. Bellows was arrested for her share of the crime, and as you know, the case comes up next week. And that's the way it shapes up. They needed someone to be a witness to the letter and hear the old man's story firsthand, and I wound up the Patsy. Expense account item three, $141.80. Hotel and incidentals while I stayed in town tying up the ends for the law. Item four, $29.65. Mileage and incidentals between New York and Hartford. Expense account total, $208.60. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. You know, many great men have attained the highest office in our land, the presidency of the United States. Can you guess the name of this man? The son of a Baptist minister, he entered Union College at Schenectady, New York, at the age of 15. He was the fourth vice president to become president through the death of the chief executive. One of his first acts as president was the signing of the Civil Service Act. The territory of Alaska was organized during his administration, and standard time was adopted throughout the country. If you don't know his name by now, here are two more clues. While he was president, the American Federal Labor was organized, and the Brooklyn Bridge was completed. Who was he? Chester Allen Arthur.